Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Allen. And I'm Derek Young, and you just stepped into the leadership brainery. Now pay close attention, because we are about to take you on a journey through our founding, focus, and future. The Leadership Brainery was birthed in 2013 out of our experiences as student leaders at Grambling State University. For those of you who do not know, Grambling is an HBCU, a historically black college and university. HBCUs are institutions that were established prior to 1964 with the principal mission of educating black Americans. The Institute for Colored Youth the first higher education institution for blacks was founded in Cheney, Pennsylvania in 1837. It was followed by two other black institutions, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania in 1854 and Wilberforce University in Ohio in 1856. HBCUs served as institutions of solidarity. The dorm rooms were transformed into meeting locations. The quads became rallying centers. Chapel basements were transformed into training grounds for nonviolent protests. And the campuses banded together, creating an intricate system of social networks. HBCUs have always been the breeding grounds for the next generation of diverse leaders. We were those leaders at Grambling State University. Jonathan was student body president. I was the director of the student government's student relations and we led transformative initiatives to increase student engagement around critical issues. We were doing so much. We led a vote campaign that registered nearly 900 students to vote in 2012. We mobilized campus coalitions to tackle tobacco on campus. We built a student resource center and computer lab in our student union. We even represented Gremlin in Israel to champion peace in the Middle East. We started getting attention from other young leaders around the country and were compelled to provide leadership trainings to help them optimize their impact on their campuses and in their communities. And that's how the Leadership Brainery was birthed. By 2015, we had trained hundreds of student leaders around the country to assist with yearly strategy, team building, constitutional revisions, and organizational transitions from year to year. We then embarked on the next phase of our journey when we both entered graduate school and experienced firsthand the racial inequities in education, particularly at predominantly white graduate and professional schools. I earned my Master's of Theological Studies, concentrating on political and liberation theologies, and afterwards I earned my Juris Doctors. In law school, I was one out of four black men who entered my first year class of about 250 students. Now I'm from the South, so this was a major culture shift for me. Not only was I now in a colder climate, but also further isolated from familiar support systems. I'm a first generation college student, and what's even more profound is I'm the first to have an advanced degree too, in fact. And I went to earn my master's in public health, concentrating in management and policy. And during my two years in graduate school, I focused on racism as a public health issue. I dove into racial health disparities and community violence, but narrowed my scholarship on how health and medicine are irresponsibly taught in the United States because of the lack of diverse perspectives within the medical schools. So I decided to stay in New England for law school because after all, the region is home to some of the world's top institutions. Growing up as a young black boy, I never thought that I would be entering a top medical school and then a top law school, and so I was so excited. And then I arrived at orientation, and out of 250 students, same size as Jonathan class, just about, I was one out of two black men in my incoming class. We made up less than 1% of our entire incoming class, and that was in 2017. So as a black man and activist, I lack the supportive community to understand my thoughts, my joys, my journeys, my pursuits, and even my pains. And because of my scholarship and racism in graduate school, I knew it was not by accident but more so because of a racist system. And so I left law school and decided to pursue the leadership brainery full time. Deciding to step away from that level of information and access is difficult, but I knew something needed to be done so that students of color did not have to experience these disparities when they seek education and leadership and generational prosperity for their families. It's really sad that even with HBCUs 
groups and after decades of affirmative action, black and Hispanic students are more underrepresented in our nation's top colleges and universities today than they were 35 years ago. If folks who look like us do not have access to education, then how will they gain access to competitive and high wage careers? How can they thrive intellectually and economically? Let's get a lay of the land. There are 330 million people living in America. According to the U.S. Census, about 60% are white, 18% are Hispanic and Latinx, 13% are black, 6% are Asian, and 1% Native American. Did you know that the average financial net worth of a white family is $171,000? That is nearly 10 times that of the average for a black family, which is about $17,000, and eight times the average for a Latinx family at $21,000. But it only makes sense. If marginalized communities don't have access to education and leadership roles that can help move the needle in their communities, and that's with all industries, law, healthcare, tech, and business. The American Bar Association states that there are nearly 1.3 million active attorneys and about 200,000 are non-white. Less than 5% of lawyers are black and out of all of the law firm partners, only 2% are black and 3% are Latinx. Now those numbers are pretty significant, especially considering how instrumental lawyers are in creating and enforcing the rules and regulations we abide by as people. The total number of students of color enrolled in law schools across the country decreased slightly in 2019, and black students represented the largest decrease. The solution is pretty simple to me. We need more diverse law students. Now this is similar in healthcare and medicine, which poses many challenges of distrust and relatability when we're talking about our health, our bodies. Among active physicians, 5.8 identified as Hispanic, 5% identify as black or African American. Would you believe me if I told you that we have a less percentage of black men in medical schools than we had 40 years ago? It's true. According to the Association of American Medical Colleges, black males represented 3.1% of medical school enrollment in 1979 and only 2.9% in the years 2019 leading to 2020. Now let's talk business. Black students comprise less than 10% of business school enrollment on average nationally. So it's no surprise that only 4.1% of U.S. chief executives and 7.8% of people in management occupations identified as black in 2019, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And according to the Council of Graduate Schools, black students still represent less than 6% of incoming masters and doctoral students at doctoral universities with very high research activities. At these same institutions, black students in incoming masters and doctoral cohorts remain very low, accounting for less than 3% in engineering, mathematics and computer sciences, and physical and earth sciences. This is in part why black and Latinx scientists and engineers are represented at 5% and 6% respectively. We must close this underrepresentation and gap in opportunity to create educational equity and generational prosperity. And a way forward is preparing and pipelining more diverse talent into competitive postgraduate programs and leadership roles in the workforce and providing them the resources to thrive. Gaining access to graduate programs at top-tier academic institutions as a person of color is becoming increasingly less likely, and we cannot afford for historically marginalized groups' futures to be lost. Education is the pillar of change. History shows us that those who gain greater access to education are those who typically gain access to influence systems and communities, and that is why the leadership brainery exists. All of these things led us to develop the Leadership Brainery's innovative National Ambassador Fellowship, and we are so excited about it. Yes, we Our are. mission is to recruit and equip extraordinary young leaders from diverse backgrounds to make change for the greater good. We are creating a national, multicultural network of diverse and first-generation college student leaders 
who desire to attend top graduate and professional schools. And for three years, our ambassadors come together to receive personal, professional, and leadership development. They receive help identifying summer internships and participate in projects to bring awareness to issues they are passionate about in their communities. Not only will competitive graduate and professional schools have well-developed and qualified diverse candidates, but communities around the country will have diverse leaders being trained to make change for the greater good. We selected our inaugural cohort in 2019 and held our inaugural National Impact Summit at Harvard Law School, thanks to our partnership with the Charles Hamilton Houston Institute for Race and Justice. Charles Hamilton Houston said, without education, there is no hope for our people, and without hope, our future is lost. Dr. Kamara P. Jones, in her Framework for Understanding Racism, identifies this as internalized racism, an acceptance by members of the stigmatized races of negative messages about their own abilities' intrinsic worth. It involves accepting the limitations of one's own full humanity and including one's spectrum of dreams, one's right to self-determination, and one's range of allowable self-expression. These unhealthy, self-perceived yet systemically driven thoughts are inaccurate and reason for the leadership brainery. More than ever, we need hope that positive societal progress will continue through the rise of responsible, respectful, and inclusive leaders who seek change for the greater good. Empowering young leaders to believe that they have the capacity to gain equally earned access to believe that they are equally or more competitive than their counterparts is necessary. If rising diverse leaders do not believe that they can gain access to influential institutions of knowledge, they will not believe they can contribute to the change we need for a more equitable and loving society. We want to end by thanking our student leaders, our ambassadors who worked so hard, all of our supporters, those who have sponsored, donated, volunteered, or even promoted the life-changing work we are doing at the Leadership Brainery. This is just the beginning of our journey toward achieving educational equity and generational prosperity for everyone. And we want you to stay on this journey with us. So please go to www.theleadershipbrainery.org. Follow us on social media at The Leadership Brainery. And we'll be seeing you soon.